Good morning. Thanks for stopping by. And you might have noticed I tried to sneak a little pun here into the title. Not sure if it's really flying, but trying my best. Essentially, what I did is I built an app starting as a monolith, then breaking it up into um, microservices using containers, and then moving on to functions to service with Lambda. And I want to report a bit on the lessons learned here, and also show you stuff, obviously. So um, a little bit about my background. I'm currently working at Red Hat uh, in the OpenShift team, mainly uh, upstream in Kubernetes. Before that, I was a developer advocate at Mesosphere and a data engineer at MapR, so two startups before Red Hat. And before that, I was in research. Uh, last four years or so, I'm mainly uh, using Go. I did a lot of different languages. Started out as a C++ and Java developer. I was young and needed the money. And over years, uh, you know, Python and Node.js and whatnot. But nowadays, my go-to tool is, is Go. No pun intended. And also, within the last couple of years, first already at MapR and then Mesosphere and now Red Hat, um, I would call myself a developer turned ops. So I started to appreciate um, what operations does and, and the best practices there, or good practices. And um, I, I try to, to get as much of that uh, on top of, of what I know from development uh, into my brain and trying to share that as well, a little. Enough about me, about you. I need to know who I speak to. So who is an admin? Good old classic admin, raise your hands. No admins, okay. Site reliability engineer. One, two, three, cool. Developer, developer, developer. All right, majority, like 80% or so, cool. Infosec, you don't dare to raise your hands? Okay, that's fine. Architect, yeah, don't be shy, that's, that's, that's fine. Product or project manager, ish, ish. Point the hairy boss, no, we're amongst us. We're, we're amongst techies, great, we will have a good time. So a little bit about the motivation, just to you know, put you in the right uh, mindset here. Why are we doing all of that? Why you know, go and um, we heard in the keynote already from Aditya around productivity. Um, at the end of the day, no matter if you're selling something or if you're in an NGO or whatever, you want to kind of outperform the competition. You want to ship faster. You want to get stuff out um, faster but also ship around the clock. So it's not like any two, three, four months, you have a big release um, and everyone dropping everything and developers throwing stuff over the wall, but it's kind of like uh, very often, maybe a couple of times per day, you're shipping small features. And containers and functions definitely help in that direction a lot. And last but not least, and for me personally, this is one of the biggest things, as I said, coming from a developer background and moving or adopting more and more at the mindset of, of uh, operations is this togetherness, right? Which is still, when I'm on site with customers, especially in bigger organizations, a, it's not that people don't want to, it is just an organizational challenge. And I, I always highlight the point, you know, whatever nice tooling I can give you, that doesn't solve your organizational issues, your, um, you know, whatever is going on in your organization. So, if you want to start somewhere, um, if you're a manager or whatever, take out uh, the dev and ops teams together, have, uh, have a nice evening, and that maybe uh, already helps a lot. All right, now let's jump into the app. I'm going to quickly show you the app. It's not very um, exciting. It's not something that uh, I'd probably be able to raise money with. It's a very simple thing, um, but you, know, you, you can try it out, and it's, it's useful for something. It's called Imagine, and what you can do is you can upload pictures. Could be cat pictures or whatever you like. So you upload the picture, and then you see it in the public gallery. Right? It's not that hard. What you also will notice is once a picture, uh, it supports JPEG and, and GIF, uh, JPEG and PNG, sorry, um, is that if you zoom in and hover over some of these pictures, you will see the, uh, as a metadata in the, in the label, you will see the dimensions. So it, it also extracts that as a metadata. It could be anything, right? You could apply machine learning to detect 
cats, for example. Um, but this is just to show you can extract something from, from that image and uh, provide that metadata there. So far, so good. Any questions, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point in time. There will be, I hope, um, some five to ten minutes at the end. But if there's anything unclear, uh, feel free to shout out. We probably, uh, I don't want to stress the, the organizers, but probably have some handhelds if you have a question right away. So if you look into it, I'm going to run it in a moment. If you look into it, just a heads up, you have essentially this uh, monolith, right? So you could build it, but for, for simplicity's sake, I'm just say go run main go here. And, um, and then you have the gallery, which is just a subdirectory. So whenever you upload something, that picture, uh, ping, or, or JPEG will end up in that gallery directory. And uh, to keep it simple, whenever I extract something, the, the metadata, which is currently just the dimension of the picture, then it will end up in a file that is, has the same name as the, the picture and then dot .meta. And there, it will just be in there as a string. Everything clear? Very, very simple. And that, that basic business logic, if you want, that will stay the same across all the three uh, setups, right? I, I try to come up with something that is so easy to understand that if you have at least a little bit of Go knowledge, you should be able, we'll walk through the code in a moment, to immediately get what's going on. Just you know, remember what it does. You can upload a picture, and it will show that in the gallery and extract the metadata. That's it. That's all it does. Okay? Cool. So yeah, let's, um, before we meet the three billy goats, Let's jump into that. You let me know. Last row. Does that work? Can you see something? Yes? Cool. So, our favorite way to start something, go run main go. So, we haven't looked at the code yet, so just looking at that, there might be some server running, and I know that it's on port 880, so I will now upload some, something. Oh, I have already something in the gallery. I might clean that out first. Uh, let's just... Uh, nope. Uh, jump. Um, yes, that's what I want. Uh, okay. Then let's just keep that for now. Um, Let's upload something just to prove that it works in the simplest case. Um, whatever, whatever picture I just took earlier on. What did I take it? 8.59, is that safe for work? I hope so. <laughs> we'll see in a moment. Okay, oh, that was, I think, before the keynote, right? Oh yeah, okay, cool. So we know, it works. Can upload something. Uh, it will serve me that, and um, if I hover over that, I get the dimensions, hopefully. Not yet, so it takes some time. Uh, I think every 10 seconds. Yeah, now it's there. I don't know if you can see it. Now it's there, right? Okay, very simple. So that's all it does. Cool, 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 cool. So we can kill that. We don't need that anymore. Now let's actually meet the three billy goats. First off, we have the monolith, then we have the microservice, the containerized microservice setup, and then we have the functions, serverless functions. Actually, if you think about the original Norwegian tail, it's the other way around, right? First, the smallest one says, hey, you know, goes over the bridge, says, hey, don't eat me, troll. Um, eat, eat my bigger brother, and so on. But we're going to go in the other direction, so and a kind of reverse uh, billy goats. <coughs> All right, as a monolith, what I try to do here is keep it as simple as possible, so really essentially just two Go routines, one uh, that serves the static assets, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and so on, and provides the API to upload and to list. And then one Go routine that does the metadata extraction. Right? So, um, you, know, you know, the old saying, if you... If, you, uh, if you're raising money, then it's uh, AI. If you're hiring, then it's machine learning. And if you're actually doing it, it's applied statistics. And that's pretty much that, that what, what it is, right? It's metadata extraction. It just looks at the dimension and prints it out, or puts that in the metadata file. 
I tried, and I, I actually uh, succeeded in this, in this setup, because I'm not doing a lot there, um, to only use standard library stuff. Nothing outside of the standard library in the monolith. Obviously, this will later on change, uh, especially with, with functions as a service. And maybe let's, let's stay one, one second at that point. One reason being that, obviously, as soon as you're using something outside of the standard library, you need to vendor stuff. Okay, so who enjoys dependency management vendoring in Go? Okay, we're in good company. Who is using, but more seriously, who is using um, either custom stuff or older stuff like Glide or whatever to do vendoring? Okay, who's using Go Dep? Seems to be 30, 40%. Who's using Vigo? Some brave souls, one, okay. Well, it's, it's early days. And in the rest, you're not vendoring, you're just, okay, cool. Yeah, pretty, pretty much as I thought, okay. Um, I also left out in, in, the, in the repo, I did leave out the part, um, the actual provisioning. So you could, you know, for example, use Terraform or whatever to uh, deploy that um, Go binary uh, for a particular uh, architecture on, on a VM in, in Azure or wherever. Um, I left out that part uh, as, a, as an exercise for the reader. That's not very, very exciting. It's the, the standard way. Uh, the only thing you have to think about is how you also get the static assets there. Go is awesome enough that uh, it will provide you with one um, binary that doesn't have any dependencies, and, and you're good regarding that part. So that's how it, how it actually looks like. Um, we've seen that uh, on the right-hand side, the, um, the browser itself, the, the web application, and the Go monolith in here essentially has these two um, Go routines in the main where um, I'm essentially serving the, the API and then a separate Go routine um, that does the extract. Right? And really what it does is it, it works against this uh, subdirectory gallery. That's it. Right? So just to reinforce that, looking at the code of the monolith, so coming from, coming from the top here, the that's main, right? So you have from the, uh, the standard library here, you have the handle function. Um, root would essentially uh, serve the static assets, whatever is in the uh, UI directory, HTML, CSS, um, JavaScript. And then I'm having uh, two handler functions for upload and gallery endpoints or paths, right? That's it. And then here is the second Go routine that takes care independently of uh, extracting the metadata and writing it into the meta file. Bless you. And then you have to listen and serve. That's, that's the usual thing. And then in handlers, obviously, um, the two handlers in there, on the one hand, uh, the upload file. So what do I need to do there? Well, if it's not the right method, so if it's some other method other than, than post, um, redirect to, to uh, root and say that's, that's not OK. Uh, otherwise, as I said, JPEG and ping uh, is supported. Um, I'm saving, essentially, the file here. Very straightforward. Otherwise, saying, hey, um, user, you made an error. I'm only supporting these two files, file formats. And the same is, is uh, happening here in the other direction for listing the files, just going through that gallery uh, directory and then uh, coming back with an ad hoc uh, entry, um, JSON struct or Go struct that, that has JSON uh, formatting here, um, where I essentially say, if it's a JPEG, JPEG or ping file, um, I'm going to also get the metadata here and then return that as a JSON format. So that's essentially on, um, on that other endpoint there. Metadata, as I said, very, very simple, flat uh, dot meta file where just reading out the, um, the metadata there. Currently, it's, ju it's just a dimension. Bless you. It's a bit cold in here, huh? Um, yeah, and that's it. So. Any questions on that level? Like, this is really just standard library, and, and I guess if you're a little experienced with Go, you've seen or written that kind of stuff a um, hundred times. Very simple. But it's important to understand what's going on. So the main um, piece to remember here, again, um, is we have two Go routines, the main Go routine serving the HTTP API and the static assets, 
and the image, um, ex the metadata extractor. And that is in here, and again, as I said, very, very simple. Just every 10 seconds um, sees, is there any, are there any new files in there, any new JPEG or ping files in there? And if so, then getting the dimension, again, everything using the, um, the standard library and uh, writing it into that meta file. That's it. Right? In this case, so you will see in there uh, whatever the dimension is, 10,000 times 600 or whatever. Any questions so far? Make sense? Cool. All right. So that is the simplest setup. That is what I would argue a lot of us are doing, building this, uh, this one monolith with all the functions in there using Go routines to uh, do things um, independently in parallel. OK. Great. Now let's move on and let's say it's a little uh, bit more ambitious application. So for this little application, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it's enough to demonstrate it. Someone tells you, we're going all in regarding containers. You need to take that monolith and move it into a microservices um, architecture. So essentially what I did, if you think about that, you have already, and I designed it that way to make it life easy for myself, obviously, we have already two more or less independent bits going on there, the HTTP API on the one hand, on the other hand, the image processing metadata extraction, right? Those were two Go routines, although I didn't have an explicit Go routine, I just leveraged the main Go routine in the monolith. So I just essentially, exactly around, uh, along these borders, I, I split them up. Put one uh, part, the container that serves the static assets and the API for the web app in one container, um, and put the other, the metadata extraction, into another container. There are many, many more options. I'm going to um, talk about that in a moment after we've seen the architecture. But what is now the case whenever you put these two things in different containers, and I'm not even talking about Kubernetes yet, but they're running in two different containers um, in, with the same setup in terms of the, the file, file, how the, the images are stored uh, in the file system. What kind of challenge are you running in now? Early on, we had that monolith that both Go routines would read and write to that local subdirectory. What kind of challenge would you see now having two containers reading and writing to some, some place in the file system? Anyone has a guess? Anyone can imagine? Well, you need to share stuff. You need to somehow share access to that storage. So what I'm using here in this setup, and that is essentially just to, to be independent of the, the target environment, I'm using Minio, which is essentially a on-premises uh, S3 solution if you want to. So we have an additional container that has nothing to do with, with the, the actual business logic. It just gives me this shared storage. And as I said, I'm going to talk about alternatives later on as well. And I'm essentially using Kubernetes to manage the entire life cycle of the application, deploying it could potentially scale it, and so on and so forth. So that's how it look like, looks like. Still the same on the right-hand side. Nothing big happened there. More or less the same on the API side. And then, can you actually see it here? Yeah, you might see it from the top. You have the deployments, which are essentially lifecycle supervisor of, of your pods. In the pods, there the actual microservices run. So you have a front-end microservice. You have an image proc microservice, and then you have the, the Minio, as I said, that provides the storage. And then you're exposing one, um, one of these pods, or as many as you, as you like, um, via front-end service to the outside world. Um, in, in my case, I'm, I'm going to show you in a moment. I'm using OpenShift, and we have a very convenient way to do that um, called routes, or you can use Ingress or other, other ways. I structured it the way that if you See it at the bottom, I'm not sure. Uh, app YAML would cover the entire app, and storage YAML would cover Minio. So I can um, quite easily, independently, um, say, apply them with, with kubectl apply, for example, and update them in, in, a, in a way. This is just like, it really doesn't matter in, in how many YAML files you, you split it up, just one way uh, for the very simple setup that, that works. Um, and that's pretty much it. So rather than having the Go routines there that run independently and in parallel, you're now running parts of the code base in one container, 
parts of the code base in another container. Any questions? Cool. Let's see that in action. Because it's always show me the code. It's not about architecture diagrams, right? All right, as I mentioned, app YAML and storage YAML. Um, if you're not that familiar with Kubernetes, just believe me, that is the way how you declare. That's the deployment. Here is the container image right? Um, that, that I want to use. Uh, certain configuration things like where do I want to mount some, some volume, and then the service down there that we will then expose to the outside world. And storage essentially just sets up Minio for us. So I have this OpenShift cluster, Kubernetes Enterprise uh, distribution, if you want, in, in short, um, available here. So I'm just going to use um, the oops. Got rid of my TMX. That's not cool. I'm going to use the containers here. And then I think it's first kubectl storage. I said, I believe. Doesn't really matter, but yeah, I already cr created the namespace. And um, I'm just going to copy that for simplicity's sake. So with that, I essentially apply all the resources I've defined in storage YAML. So the deployment and the, um, the service there. And then I, after that, I should have uh, Minio uh, running in that uh, namespace, Imagine, or project, as we call it, in, in OpenShift. All right, and the same for the app. And then we'll have a look at it. It takes always a little while um, when you go off and deploy something until um, the runtime, the container runtime, uh, is able to pull the, the image from uh, from a registry, so uh, depending on, on, uh, on the network there, uh, might take a moment, a minute or two. So now we have these, these three things here, as, as you've seen in the architecture diagram, the Minio stuff running here internally, uh, only image proc, it's already up and running, and the front end. And if we look into one of those pods in here, um, we would expect, um, oops, not the terminal, but the logs. That is exactly the, the output. I don't know if you can see it in the, in the back. Um, it says, imagine server running, and uh, essentially just trying to, to screen if there is anything in there um, synchronizing between the, the front end and, and the back end. And uh, the same is true for image proc. There is nothing there uh, yet. I haven't uploaded anything yet, so I wouldn't expect that uh, logs that uh, I see anything here. As soon as I upload anything or something, then, then uh, of course. OK, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose it. Um, because so far, this service, this front-end service, was only available within the cluster. So from the outside world, uh, no one could use that. So now I'm, if you want, publish that to the outside world. And that I do by um, exposing the the service front end. I get a route, I create a route with that, and I get a URL. And that URL um, should show up here. And if I click on that, I hopefully see the same thing that I saw um, earlier on local. So now you can actually go to that URL if you want to. You can upload stuff. But again, please be aware of that this is recorded. So imagine, imagine something nice. So this URL is public now. You can go there if you want to. And I can upload stuff. Right, hopefully. Again, uh, maybe here, this one uploaded successfully, great, and uh, is there. And no metadata yet. Takes a bit, as I said. Usually, I think I have the same delay, it's 10 seconds. Um, still not, okay. Okay, maybe it's more than 10 seconds. Eventually, we will get there. Yep, it's there. OK. So now we know it works. And um, we can also have a look at the, the respective blocks there. Um, OK, nothing too interesting here. But hopefully, in the, in the image.
package proc, we should see some action in the part. Right, so it got something. It says, oh, okay, I, I've seen a new file. I'm going to extract that metadata from it. Okay, that's what it is. And they are very loosely coupled, these two uh, microservices, right? The only thing that they have um, in common is essentially um, Minio, which is more or less this, uh, this S3 interface, where whenever someone uploads something, the front end would put it into, th think of, of it like, like S3 uh, in that Kubernetes cluster, puts it in a certain bucket, in a certain uh, position, and then image proc every 10 seconds or whatever, uh, sees, reads through that uh, bucket and sees what's, what's new there, and whenever there is not yet a metadata file available, it will create that and put it back into the bucket. Right? Any questions? Cool. All right. As I said earlier on, there are multiple ways how you can do the migration or, or you know, moving from a monolith to containers. One of them is known as lift and shift or put the monolith into a container. I could have just uh, taken the monolith that I wrote in the first place and just put it into a container. Right? Creating a con container image with that monolith would have worked. Right? There are, however, and, and many people are doing that, and, and that's okay. Right? There is no, there's nothing bad per se about that pattern, um, but there are certain things that you will only benefit if you are taking a different route. Not saying that the route I took is the most optimal one, it's one option. Another option would, would have been to put both of these application containers into the same pod in Kubernetes. A pod in Kubernetes is essentially a, uh, a management unit, if you want, that Kubernetes has with the guarantee that all its containers will be scheduled on the same pod. And they have certain um, ways to share data both on the network and they see each other, or all the containers in the pod see each other on uh, localhost, so uh, you essentially only need to manage the port mappings there, um, and you can share data via a local volume. So that would have been nice because then I wouldn't have needed uh, to deploy Minio to, do, to have this shared storage space, but if I have that set up, then I can only scale, I can effectively only vertically scale. I can only scale the entire thing, all the, the entire pod, or I, I cannot scale like only the front end, for example, right, based on, on the traffic. There is another um, way um, that is pretty close to what I have done with S3, just using a, um, a Kubernetes primitive called persistent volumes. So you have these different containers in different pods. You can independently scale them, and all of them are per se stateless, right? All of them just read from some shared storage and write back to that. You can just scale them independently, but using persistent volume. Now, persistent volume is a kind of umbrella term. There are the, the first question you always have to ask, by, by what is it backed? So it could be, for example, that on AWS you might have EBS, uh, you might have something in your uh, on-premise data center using Ceph, Cluster, whatever. You might have NFS, whatever backs that, um, that persistent volume. Um, and there, so in, to a certain degree, this is less portable because you need to know um, what kind of backing you have. So if, you, if you're an AWS shop and have everything in AWS, then you know you will have EBS volumes, and that's it. You're done. If you're, for example, starting off with your Kubernetes journey on-premises and then move to the cloud, well, you need something on-premises that could be, for example, Ceph. Um, so with S3, with this Minio um, container that I deployed there, I essentially worked around that. The drawback is that in uh, the setup when I rely on or would rely on persistent volume, then Kubernetes would do the heavy lef lifting for me. Kubernetes would essentially take care of, and, and the, the backing volume would take care of uh, the data sharing. In this case with S3, I needed to go encode that in the application, needed to go like go to that bucket, check it every 10 seconds, is there something you copy it locally, do something with it, copy it back to the, to the bucket. So here it's really a question of, um, Portability, how much locking do you want to have, um, and um, yeah, how flexible are you there? But all of these decisions come with certain implications. Last but not least, and I think we are more or less good in time, functions. Um, serverless sometimes 
serverless being more or less the umbrella term, um, one kind of serverless is function as a service. So essentially, if you think again back to the monolith, we had one uh, code base with these two functionalities. I broke it down into three functions. And that doesn't sound like a lot compared to the two containers we had there, ignoring the, the Minio part. Um, but typically, you would end up with many, many more functions, right? In this case, we only had these three passes, these three uh, functionalities there. So I ended up with three functions. One that does upload an image, one that lists images along with the metadata, and one for metadata extraction. Since I, at some point in time, I had to decide what environment I'm deploying in, and I picked AWS Lambda for that, um, I was able to simply use S3 as the shared storage, managed for me, it's essentially serverless uh, storage there. Um, and also, I'm using S3 for serving the static um, buckets, uh, the, sorry, the st static content, HTML, CSS, and so on from that bucket. Um, I could have uh, ha had a fourth function that would deliver that static uh, content, would also have been possible, but it's, it's simpler. And essentially, the three main parts I'm using is AWS Lambda, the API Gateway, and CloudWatch. And that is the architecture. So you have the S3 tier that has these two buckets, Imagine Static, which essentially has HTML, CSS, and so on, serving the, the static things. You have Imagine Gallery, uh, where you're storing the images and the metadata. And then you have these three functions in Lambda, uh, upload file, list file, and extract meta. And then, as usual, in a um, function as a service deployment, you need some kind of triggers. So what kind of triggers do I need? Well, obviously, I want to have upload file and list file exposed through HTTP. That's why I'm using the API gateway here. And whenever someone does a post, for example, an upload, then that triggers the function upload file. The same is true for list files. A get on gallery will trigger the list files and will return the, uh, the JSON payload that we've seen in the monolith. Very same business logic. What's with extract meta? In the case of a container or the monolith, we just had a for loop in there that would every 10 seconds would do something. That's not what, what happens in, in this function as a service world. Right? You always need a trigger. In this sense, the trigger here is time. So you can say, for example, using CloudWatch, say, call that function every, in this case, 10 seconds. But you always need a trigger. Having a function alone doesn't do anything. Something needs to trigger that function to actually execute. Any questions here? So I'm going to repeat that, although I didn't really hear a question. It was more like a comment. Uh, what you're essentially saying is that what I've done here is an anti-pattern in terms of uh, rather than using one bucket, I should have one bucket where stuff is uploaded, trigger that, and then putting it in another. Absolutely. I'm not claiming to be a serverless function as a service pro. In fact, that is the first application that I really did end-to-end -end with it. I'm a container guy. I should have maybe mentioned that. Um, but a great point. So I'm, I'm not claiming that this is best practice. All I'm, I'm saying is this is how I, with my naive understanding of Lambda, uh, have, uh, and, and coming from, from the monolith and containers, how I have, um, have done that. Uh, it's up on GitHub, so for requests are welcome. <laughs> More than welcome. I, I really appreciate, I'm not just saying it, I really uh, would appreciate, uh, because I, I want to keep it fair, right? I, I, I know and can apply the good practices in, in the sense, in the container setup, but here I'm not claiming to be an expert. So Pull requests, more than welcome. Thank you. Um, OK, so we had that already early on. That's fine. Um, so let's move on to, oh, hang on. I, I wanted to show you one thing at that point. That's true. Just to give you an idea and to make the point later on um, around the lessons learned, that if you look at functions, and I'm kind of lazy in the sense that I'm always trying to keep it as simple as possible to not introduce additional things. So I've been using the AWS CLI directly there. 
There are better options, I'll get to that in, in a moment. But if you have that, this shows you just for one function what you need to do. There are also preparation steps in terms of creating the buckets there. So let's, let's maybe not look at that. But you, know, you have the UI there. You have the Lambda functions there. You need to create the respective roles, the IM stuff. You need to create the entries in the API gateway. Um, then you can build the function locally and upload it. <clears throat> First, you need to create the function. Obviously, you can upload the code there. Um, you can test it like that without any API gateway. Now you do the HTTP API gateway integration, creating the resource there, the path there, um, put the integration in place. Again, uh, permissions not to forget. Um, and then that essentially uh, pulls that all together. And um, well, that, that is the actual integration bit. And then, uh, sorry, where do we have? Here we have the actual integration bit where we say if that path is, um, there's, there's uh, some HTTP verb at that path, then trigger um, this function. Right? That's the integration between Lambda and the HTTP, the API gateway. And at the end of the day, you can do that. Right? So this is for one function. And you can imagine like manually doing that, that's no fun at all. So you would probably put it in some shell script or whatever, but there are better ways. Um, just trying to drive the point home that manually doing that, it works, but it's not very fun. So what are the lessons learned? And obviously, uh, as I said, I'm a container person. Uh, might be a little biased here. I found that from the monolith to containers, the, the way um, I had a couple of op found a couple of options, and, and it was pretty straightforward. I didn't really have to change a lot or, or whatever. On the other hand, I found that functions, and maybe it's easier if you start from scratch rather than if you're looking at an existing monolith to break it down into functions, requires a slightly different way of thinking. Um, so somewhere further down the line than, than if you have microservices, way further down the line. I strongly believe that if you compare what's going on in a monolith, no matter if it's you know, the two or three of you or uh, 50 people, that both containerized microservices and functions actually increase the development and deployment velocity a lot, but also introduce new challenges. In, this, in the context of containers, um, you have to answer questions like, how do I actually build and maintain my images? I did it here very simple. I just did local build and put, pushed it into, um, into Quay IO, into a registry. Um, but you need to set it up somehow for all your developers. And Kubernetes core doesn't give you that. Um, things like the, the OpenShift project that I'm working on, or part being part of, gives you that. But you need to come up with some strategy. Same for routing and many other things. So how do you get traffic from the outside world to the <coughs> cluster to the, to the containers the other way, and the other way? And with functions, Particularly if you're talking about debugging, you can't really do that locally. So you always have to publish them and see how they work, uh, in, in this case, in Lambda. And also, if you have many, if you don't have a handful like three or five or 10, if you're breaking down a bigger monolith, you might end up with 200 functions. Um, you need to orchestrate them on all levels. Um, I don't have really good, maybe we have uh, another comment or question how to go about that uh, orchestration, but I don't really have a, a good answer yet. In container land, I would argue that by end of 2017, more or less since then, Kubernetes is, is the standard in terms of container uh, orchestration, and with that you have the portability guarantee. It doesn't matter if you are starting off on-premises and then moving to AWS or moving from AWS to Azure or whatever, all of them, everyone supports Kubernetes, and you have that portability. And you can, with that, you can avoid login. The question that I sometimes get is, in the context of Go, do containers actually make sense? And I would say a definitive maybe, because uh, on the one hand, what containers really do for you is they manage the application level dependencies. Now, given that Go actually produces a nice binary, you don't have that issue that you know, Python or Node.js, whatever, have, where you, you, know, you might run something different on your laptop than in staging or in production. You have a statically linked binary. Everything is there. So for this part, containers don't really give us anything. But there are other things. If you think about the front end, 
you had static assets. How do you get that into Go? I know I, I've written that myself, and there are certain packages out there. But let's be honest, everyone who has already done that, that's not really nice. That's not cool. So in that sense, if you have any other asset outside of the binary that you need to package, that is already um, an advantage, and that there definitely makes sense. And obviously, also, if, if, you're, if you have already decided, I'm going to go for communities, you might have other programming languages, then, well, you need to create a container image even for your Go programs anyways. I believe that with functions, um, so serverless approach, functions as service, the big advantage is that developers really don't need to care about all these infra bits. What's the container image? Best practices or good practices around you know, keeping the base image small and secure and so on and so forth. All I do is literally, here is my function. Go execute it if this trigger happens. But as I, I hope I've, I've motivated you when I've shown you the, the function um, readme there, this low-level CLI of, of, of AWS doing all these steps, and that was just one function, uh, is really unusable. I'm not saying it doesn't work. Of course it works and works as, as expected, but it's really a lot of work and we really don't want to do that uh, for every function. So at the end of the day, my hunch would be that most of the p people who actually do that seriously in production would end up using things like CloudFormation, SAM, the serverless application model by AWS, serverless framework, or anything higher level but not the low level uh, CLI. Again, I'm more than happy to um, be corrected here. It's just my hunch and based on my experience here. One last thing, uh, a note in, in this aspect here. Keep an eye on the ratio of code, business logic, whatever you're actually writing in Go, versus configuration, deployment, descriptors, and whatnot. And that's certainly higher in, in the context of containers and functions than in the monolith. And then a couple of questions that you, I, I'm not providing answers here, I'm just motivating you to have a look at that. What about observability? Um, how do you monitor stuff, right? Containers or functions, logging around that. In both containers and functions, you kind of need a distributed tracing. You might have so many microservices, containerized microservices and function running that you don't even know which one of them causes you uh, troubles, right? With a monolith, it's easy. That's the binary. That's where I need to go. With, with microservices and functions, it could be any of those. And without distributed tracing, you're literally blind. And what about security? Um, people go like, well, you know, containers are not as secure as VMs, which I, especially if you go down to list and list, or later on listen to, to her stuff, uh, which I don't believe, uh, just a matter of how you use it. But uh, sometimes people also argue, or the same people would argue that um, Functions as a service, uh, Lambda, whatever, is perfectly secure. You can't do anything there. Well, it turned out last year, I think at, at uh, Black, Black Hat, um, someone showed how to break out of a Lambda function, do something there. So uh, security is, is always there, and you need, even as a developer, you need to, to pay attention to that. A couple of resources you might find interesting, trying to cover all these, these areas. Um, so the cloud native theme there. Most of them are free. We actually also have the DevOps with OpenShift book at the booth downstairs if you want to drop by. And uh, with that, I hope we still have a moment or two for Q&A. No. <laughs> well, then, thanks a lot.